Hey, it's Mr. Sorensen, and today I'm going to show you a really cool project that we're going to make on the lathe. Now, you're currently working on the salad forks, bent wood lamination. What we need to go with those salad forks is a salad bowl, and so this is what we're going to begin to work on. I'm going to show you how to make this. The lathe is a really cool tool to be able to use. In fact, you can see here a variety of different projects that get made on the lathe. So things like um, candlesticks. Here's candlestick with a free ring cut on there using the uh, lathe tools. Here is, uh, it could be a candlestick or just a fun decoration, a little snowman. And you maybe have seen some of these wooden pins around the classroom or some of the, your fellow students might have some of those out there that you've seen them use. Those are also made on the lathe. Well, you might just be wondering, what is a lathe? And so you see me working on a lathe right here in front of you. We're going to take a block of wood and we're going to mount it to a motor and we're going to turn that piece of wood on and spin it using the lathe and then we're going to take a lathe tool this is called a bowl gouge and we're going to stick that bowl gouge in there and we're going to start cutting on that piece of wood so talk about excitement this is one of the most difficult tools to use in the entire wood shop but I'm gonna show you how to use it fairly quickly here. And uh, I'll give you the techniques that you need to use it and be safe. And then you're gonna to get to go to work making your basic laminated bowl using this machine called the lathe. Now, I like to liken the lathe to a sports analogy. The, so the sanders and saws that we've used so far, for the most part, are like a soccer ball. Most of us could walk up and kick a soccer ball pretty easily. But the lathe is a lot more like a baseball game. This would be a, like into trying to hit a ball that's being thrown at you at 70 miles an hour while holding a little stick and doing the hitting with that. Way more complicated, way more difficult than taking a board over to the sander and sanding a slight radius to it. That makes this... Uh, lathe tool a lot harder to use. Some people get the hang of it very quick. Some people it takes a little bit longer because it's just not as easy a tool to get the hang of. But we're going to give it a shot and we're going to use this tool to make the basic laminated bowl. So let's get started. Well, the bowl starts with a piece of wood that looks like this. This is a one by 12. And out of a piece of one by 12, we're gonna cut a square. Now, this piece is about 24 inches long. You may get a piece out of the back room that's six feet long, it doesn't matter. What you want to do out of the one by 12 is cut a square. Now that means that the first thing I need to know is how wide is the board? The board's 11 and a quarter. You say, well, Mr. Schwartz, you called it a one by 12. That's true. Two by fours are not two inches by four inches. They're a little bit smaller. Wood dries out as it, uh, as it ages. And so the boards tend to be a little smaller than the actual size that you're paying for. So this one by 12 is 11 and a quarter inches wide. That means I'm going to put a mark down here at 11 and a quarter inches. And that's where I'm going to cut it. To cut a board that's 12 inches wide, I'm going to need to use the radial arm saw. So we're down here at the radial arm saw to do that. Um, I don't need to rough cut it. Rough cutting means I'm going to add an inch to it. I don't need that because this is the exact piece of wood that I'm using. So I'm going to go ahead and cut it right at 11 and one quarter, and I'll be ready to move on to the next step. Well, 
there's my square piece, 11 and a quarter by 11 and a quarter. So we're ready to move on to the next step. Well, the next step of my bowl is to put a hole in the center of this one by 12 that I've cut so that I can rotate it around a center point and cut circles out of it. To do that, my first step is going to be to mark the center of a piece of wood. I can do that in one of two ways. So I can draw a line from corner to corner like that. All I need is a line in the center and then turn it and go from the opposite corner. That's gonna put a mark right in the center. The other way to find the middle, obviously, would be to measure the board. That's 11 and a quarter. Divide that in half. Half of 11 is five and a half. Uh, half of a quarter is an eighth. Five and a half plus an eighth is five and five eighths. So, put a mark at five and five eighths. Same difference, right? I'm gonna end up with a point in the middle either way. The next thing I need to do is drill the hole. Now to drill the hole for this to work right, I need this tiny 1 16th inch drill bit. So I'm gonna find that either on the magnet right here on the drill, I'm gonna find it in the drill bit cabinet or you're gonna get it from the teacher. I'll put the drill bit in the drill chuck and tighten it up. Then I'm gonna set my piece of wood on here. It's right in the middle, and now I will clamp that piece of wood down. All right, so let's check it out. Make a slight adjustment. And that looks really good. All right, I've got a hole. I've got a tiny hole in the center of the board. You can see it right there. My next step is to drive a nail into this little hole that I just drilled into the board. So in the tool cabinet, there's a can that has nails in it. And I'm gonna grab a hammer and I'm gonna drive that nail in. Notice I'm doing it on top of a scrap piece. I don't want any holes in the tabletop. And I want the nail all the way through so that it sticks out like that in the back, okay? Now, we're gonna take that nail and we're gonna put it in a fixture and the piece of wood will spin around in a circle and the bandsaw is gonna be able to cut out rings or circles out of this piece of wood. So let's go to the bandsaw now and see how that's set up. To begin with, on the bandsaw, I'm gonna reach under the table and the trunnion and I'm gonna loosen up the handles that are holding the table tightly. The handles look like that. All right, when I loosen up the handle down here, I don't want to loosen it too much because there are gears that are going to go like that. And I need to make sure that the gears are uh, engaged down here. Next, I'm going to turn this little handle. And I want to turn it so that the arrow is on 45 degrees. Now I'm going to lock the handle back underneath here. Tighten it up, and that'll just hold the table at the 45 degrees until I'm done. So now I need the fixture that I'm going to put my block of wood on that will allow me to spin this around in circles. Let's take a look at where the fixture is. I'm going to come around to the back side of the bandsaw, and I'm going to find it right here, hanging on the back of the bandsaw. There's the fixture that we need to do the cutting. On the back of the fixture, I have this little runner 
That runner is gonna fit on the miter gauge slot on the bandsaw. And the fixture slides in and out like that on the bandsaw. The next thing I wanna do here is raise the guide up a little bit. That's gonna make room for my piece of wood that will go on here. The next thing I'm gonna do is grab my clamp and I'm gonna preset the clamp to the right thickness. So before I get this started, I wanna make sure my clamp is absolutely ready to lock into place. All right, that looks pretty good. So now I'm gonna release it. I'm gonna set it up here. And to do this, I have to start by pushing the block of wood on the fixture into the moving blade. Then I can begin my cut. So you'll notice on the fixture, the number one, two, three, and four. I always have to start my cutting on hole number one and end my cutting on hole number four. If I skip over any of them or miss one, it's very hard to back up. In fact, uh, it's unlikely that we would be able to do that. So it's, it's best to be paying attention. I'm gonna cut first in hole number one. All right, so there it is. Now I can spin that piece of wood around in a circle because it's sitting in a hole. That nail is sitting in a hole. Now I'm gonna put this on the bandsaw. I'm gonna put it on the bandsaw. I wanna cut with the grain of the wood. The reason for that is that when it dries, it kind of hides the glue joint and maybe the glue joint kind of disappears because it looks like some of these grain of the wood. All right, now to go much further, I got to turn my saw on. So I'm going to push it all the way forward until it stops. Now I'm going to grab my clamp. And I'm going to clamp my fixture on there. With the fixture clamped onto the bandsaw, now I'm ready to turn the piece of wood. Now, it can be very deceptive. I'm pushing over here, but my finger is always headed towards the blade. So if I'm not careful, that blade is gonna come out of the board where I least expect it and off goes my finger. So I wanna be very cautious to keep my hands away from the blade. I also wanna keep the board pushed down to the tabletop right at the blade. So I want to keep put pressure right here at the blade so that the piece of wood stays tied to the table. I don't, I don't care about down here. Right here where the, where the blade is, is where I need the board resting on the bandsaw table. All right, so I've cut around in a full 360 degree circle. All right, bring the bandsaw to a complete stop. Take out my first piece that I need. And this piece right here, this is all scrap. So this can go in a trash can. Now I'm ready for cut number two. So I'm gonna move my nail up to the hole that is labeled two. And I'm gonna repeat that process all over again. Again, I line up the grain of the wood with the cut. All right, so the grain of the wood is now lined up with the cut. Pause and lock the fixture onto the table.
and now I can turn my block of wood around in a 360 degree circle and it will cut out ring number one. Bring that to a stop. I have to take that apart. Pull that off. There's my ring. So my bowl is going to consist of three of these rings and a bottom piece. At this point, I want to be very careful because these rings are very brittle. If I drop this, it's going to break apart. And now my bowl is done. I can't really glue the rings back together. It's, it's really important that they never break. So. Um, I'm going to be very careful with that. I'm going to set it over here on the table. And now I'm ready for cut number three. I'm going to line up the grain of the wood with the cut. done with my cutting so I'm gonna go ahead and put the, the table back to 90 degrees unless somebody else is gonna be using it because if somebody's building another project and they come up to this they're not gonna understand what to do with it so I'll take the final ring out I'll put that back over here very quickly before someone else needs it I'm gonna go ahead and take my fixture Hang it back up here. Loosen up the handle. Put the table back to 90. And tighten this up. So here's the bowl that we just cut out on the bandsaw. The first thing I need to do is I need to get rid of this nail. I don't need that anymore. So I'll bring it back to my block of wood here. And I'm gonna pull the nail out. So that is now gone. Well, to glue this together, I'm gonna need a ring I'm going to use a vise, and so I'm going to loosen this up. I'm going to clamp the ring into a vise. I'm also going to use a piece of paper. So I'm going to take this half sheet of paper and I'm going to fold it several times. This piece of paper folded two or three times is my glue applicator. So this ring is fairly delicate. If I pull it apart too much to try to stick a, uh, a glue brush or something down in there, I'm likely to snap it apart. So I don't wanna put any pressure on the ring. I wanna open it the least possible, slide the glue in there and then shut it. So this works great, right? I can move the glue around, spread it around inside the glue joint without ever moving the ring apart and putting pressure on it. So let's take and put a little bit of glue into the opening and then we'll clamp this together. All right, there's some glue in there. Now I'm gonna take my paper and make sure it covers everything. 
This is one of those places that I do not want to be a weak glue joint. If this is a weak glue joint, the chances of it falling apart are pretty high. I think here I'd rather err on the side of too much glue than not enough. All right, so now I'm gonna take my C-clamp And when I clamp this, I want to make sure that this surface right here, the face and the face, we want the face on this side of the glue joint to be flush with the face on this side of the glue joint. If there's a big discrepancy, if one is lower than the other, it's going to create a problem as we go forward. And in the end, my bowl, instead of being this tall, is going to end up being this tall. So. The flatter I can get this, the better it's going to be. And I want to just put a little bit of pressure on here. I don't want to, I don't need too much. Just enough to hold it until the glue dries. All right, that looks pretty good. Now this happened to be a fairly long cut. So there's a long tail sticking out of here. And if I'm not careful, if I don't glue all of it, I'm gonna end up with a problem. So I'm gonna grab another clamp, Let's try this one. And I'm gonna put it down on this end of this long tail. And I'm gonna tighten that up. So that little F clamp works as well. Those two clamps work the best for this. And I wouldn't get much bigger than what you see here. Uh, if, if the only clamps that are left are a lot bigger than this, I might just wait for somebody else's to finish and then take them off and put them on mine. But that's ready to go. So if I'm working on this during the class period, I, I can now take that and I can go put it in my cupboard in the back to dry. Before I take this to the cupboard to put it in there to dry, I'm going to put my name on it. Mr. Sorensen. Then I want to put it in a couple places, right? I'm going to put it out here on the bevel, not on the flat surface. If I put it on the flat surface then, and I glue stuff on top of that pencil, it will always have a dark mark there. If I put it on this bevel out here, eventually that gets cut off. So I want to write my name on here. And with your name on it, it's much less likely that anybody will ever mess with it. That one is ready to go into the cupboard in the back. All right, well, I need to go ahead and put the remainder of these rings together. So as soon as I get them glued, I'll come back and show you what our next step is. Well, my rings are glued up and dried, they've dried for 24 hours. So I'm ready to go ahead and take the clamps off and move on to the next step. I wanna be careful that I don't drop the, the ring, it'll break. These are very fragile. Also, I wanna be careful that if this, if for some reason the clamp got glued onto the ring, um, I wanna carefully get it off. If, you're, if, you, if you just, uh, are too rough with the rings, unfortunately they'll break and then it has to be all done over again. All right, so there are my pieces and when this is done, now it's gonna get stacked up like that. And that, you can see that's the beginning of what turns out to be this bowl here. So the next thing that we need to do is we need to flatten the surfaces. If you remember what we've done here is we've taken this ring, we, it was cut in half and we glued the two halves back together again. Now, if, you're, if you glued it carefully and the surface here of the ring is nice and flat, you don't have a lot to do. If one half of the ring is a lot higher or lower than the other half of the ring where the two pieces glued together, 
we have to make that flat. So we have a lot of work to do. There's two different ways that I can sand the rings to make them flat. I'll show you a quick one right here. So I'm gonna take a board. There, These boards are in the power tool cabinet. There's a board with sandpaper glued to the board. I will take this and I'm gonna clamp it to the tabletop. This isn't gonna work unless you actually clamp the sandpaper into place. With the sandpaper clamped to the table, tabletop, I can now take my ring and move it back and forth like that on the sandpaper. And this is, works especially well for the rings that are virtually flat. There's just a faint um, hint of glue right there. Then this process goes pretty quick and this is probably faster than actually running it through a machine. I can flip it over, do the same thing to the other side. Now, while I'm doing this, it's really important that I keep that ring flat on the sandpaper. If I lift it up at all like that while I'm sanding, I'm gonna start to sand a bevel on here, and when I go to glue it to the next ring, I'm gonna end up with a problem. I'll end up with a gap. So very carefully, I wanna make sure it's very flat on the sandpaper as I do this. You can flip it over, do the other side. And I'm just gonna sand until I can feel that that surface is perfectly flat. Once the surface is perfectly flat, I'm done and I can go on to the next ring. So this is one way to do that. And I would do that, I would choose this way if my rings were basically flat to begin with. Let's go take a look at the second way that we can sand the rings flat. The second way that I can sand my rings flat is using the drum sander. The rings begin at three quarters of an inch thick. So when I use the sander to flatten this out, I'm gonna need to start here by adjusting the table height to three quarters of an inch or maybe a little more. I'll probably start a little wider than three quarters of an inch because if this surface isn't perfectly flat, that means one of them is up, one of them is down. That makes it a little wider than three quarters of an inch. So I'll probably start at uh, let's say seven eighths, right around seven eighths, and I'll slowly move towards three quarter. So right down here is the ruler and there's a little um, gauge. Up here on top is the crank handle that I'll turn. And I'm gonna set the drum sander right around seven eighths of an inch. Now I'm gonna put the pieces in here. I'm gonna listen to hear if the sandpaper starts sanding as it goes through. If no sanding, right, and I'm gonna know whether it sands or not by the sound change. If no sanding occurs, I'm going to raise up the table just a slight bit. I'll put the piece through again until I hear the sanding taking place. And then I'm just gonna check the ring until the bottom is smooth. I'll flip it over and do the other side. When it's smooth, I'm done. Now the other thing I need to make sure I do when I use a drum sander is turn on the air. So I've got the air going as well. That's going to keep all of this sawdust from billowing out of the machine. And I'm ready to start.
after a handful of passes, and again, um, this is not based on one pass and it's good. This is based on sending the piece through, feeling it, looking to see, maybe making a slight adjustment, send it through again. When the surface is flat, I'm gonna turn it over, make the other side flat. And so you saw me go through that process. All the sides are flat. This, uh, this set of rings is now ready to glue together. So let's go back to the table and do that. All right, well, with the rings all sanded, they are going to really stack up nicely as I put these together and glue them into the bowl shape. So before I start gluing them with the waterproof glue, and when I do this, I wanna use waterproof glue because if you end up using the bowl as an actual kitchen utensil, right? If you wanna put stuff in it, you can do that. But if you're gonna put stuff in it and end up washing it, you really need waterproof glue as opposed to regular glue or the bowl is gonna delaminate. So as I prepare to glue the bowl together, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my pencil and I'm gonna spend a second and I'm gonna put these rings back together, stacking them up exactly the way they came apart, which means I want the grain to align. So on this ring, what I notice is that there's a lot of lines going in this direction. Over here, there's a bunch of them that are all grouped tightly together. And over here, they are spaced out, so they are much further apart. I'm gonna look on the ring that sits below this and I'm gonna find that same orientation. On this side over here, I have a bunch of lines all bunched together. Over here, I have a line that's much more spread out. So I'm gonna orient this next ring in that same fashion. And I'm gonna go like that and line it up. So all the grain lines up. And the reason that we do that is the, the, if there's a cup, right? If there's a warp to the piece of wood that we're building the bowl out of, if we realign it so that all the warping lines up correctly, we're, we're less likely to end up with a problem. Once it's all turned down, none of that will show. But if I take a warp in this direction and I take a warp in this other direction and lay them on top of each other, I'm gonna end up with gaps all around on the bowl and it's gonna create some safety and uh, appearance problems for me. So realigning the grain makes this go much better and it looks very good when we're done. It tends to look better if all the grain is aligned. So I'm gonna come over to this ring. Again, wide spacing here, narrow spacing bunched together on this side. So I'm gonna align that just like this. Now, the next thing that I need to do, once I get all of that aligned, the next thing I knew, need to do is I need to align the rings like a bullseye, right? So imagine if you were gonna do some target practice at a bullseye. A bullseye is a series of rings that get smaller and smaller and they're all concentric. Concentric means with the same center, with center, concentric means with the same center. So every ring on a bullseye has the same exact center point. And that's exactly what I wanna do with my bowl here. So I'm gonna look around the ring and make sure that the spacing is equal all the way around. I don't want a wide space here and a narrow space here. So I'm gonna push the ring around a little bit until I get it so that the spacing looks completely equal. Then I'm gonna move to the next ring up and I'm gonna do the same thing. All right, now all of the rings seem to be perfectly centered going down. So I'm going to start by putting my hand right there. I don't want this to move. And I'll start by drawing a circle around each of the rings. Now, this is best done when there's no glue on it. With glue on it, all of this stuff is gonna to wanna to slide around. So before I am putting glue on it, <clears throat> before that, I've got a big giant mess here, I want this all aligned properly. The second thing I wanna do without moving anything is I wanna take my pencil and I'm just gonna draw a line down the side of the bowl, all the way down. So now, if the ring starts to twist, 
I can see the, two, the line doesn't line up, right? The line looks like that, and I'm just gonna turn the, the ring until the line lines back up. Now, it's gonna be really easy to get all of these rings aligned, even though I have to start by taking them apart. <clears throat> and I'm ready to put my glue on. Again, I'm using waterproof glue. I'm gonna use a glue brush, and I wanna make sure I have plenty of glue on here. The bowl becomes a safety problem. It becomes a, a, a risk of coming apart if these are not glued very well. So here's my ring. I have a pencil line on it that you can see. I want the glue on the inside. Inside the pencil line is where the glue should be. No glue on the outside of the pencil line. I'll go like that, I'll spread that around with my brush. All right, so that looks pretty good. I'm ready to take this ring and I'm gonna set it on there. And again, I wanna use all of my pencil marks to align everything. It's really important that there's no spot on the ring where there, it lacks glue because now the, the bottom ring will not be attached to the ring above it. That point becomes a weak point where the piece of wood could break apart. And then if that happens, the whole bowl is gonna explode off of the, the lathe. So I'm ready to set this down, orient it in the right direction. I come over, make sure my pencil line lines up. I have a circle, so I'm gonna move it around until it sits right in the middle of that circle. So let me go ahead and finish this. I'll, I'll get the two remaining rings put on here, and then I'll come back and we'll move on to the next step. Well, my glue is on there now. I think they're well glued. Uh, all of the surface area had glue on it, so I don't expect there to be any problems, and everything seems to be fairly well aligned. So the bowl is now ready to clamp down and allow the glue to dry. Right before I do that, there's one last thing I wanna do. We're gonna put this bowl on the lathe using a faceplate. You see a bunch of little holes here to put screws in. What I don't want to do is drive screws into the bottom of my bowl. That would put holes in the bottom. Potentially when I'm cutting uh, on the lathe, I might my cutting tool might hit one of the screws. At the very least, when the bowl is done, it has holes in it. And so potentially if I had a liquid in the bowl, it would just go right through the hole. So not a good idea to have holes in a bowl. So what I want to do is I'm going to put Another piece of wood, uh, this is just a scrap piece. I'm gonna put that on the back of there, drive my screws into it, turn the bowl, and then break that off. And now the bowl is completely free of the screw hold. Here's how I get this ready to go and then attached. I'm gonna grab another face plate, right? You can see this is a little bit bigger in size. I'm gonna set it on a piece of scrap wood. Notice somebody else cut their circle out of this piece as well. So we wanna use up all the scrap wood out of the scrap bin. I'm gonna grab a pencil and I'm gonna draw a circle around that. There it is. I'm gonna take this over very quickly to the bandsaw and cut the circle out. Well, after adjusting the guide and guard on my bandsaw to the right height, about a quarter of an inch above the block of wood, I'm ready to cut this out. Now, one thing I really need to note on the bandsaw about cutting a circle like that. If I'm cutting a piece of wood that is using a twisting action, you can see what happens here. As I cut, my thumb comes around the board and gets closer and closer to the blade. When I cut this, if I'm putting a lot of force against the, the block of wood to get it to rotate into the blade, and then all of a sudden the blade comes through one of the edges, it's gonna go like this. 
and my thumb, which started over here, is now all the way around and into the blade. So this is a common type of injury on a bandsaw. I'm cutting a piece with a twisting motion and all of a sudden my thumb ends up in the blade because I'm pushing so hard. I want to really keep from doing that. I want to twist a little bit, but I want to really keep from twisting too hard so that my thumb could come around and end up in the blade. Got to be careful for that. All right, here we go. All right, so there's my circle. I know what a lot of you are thinking. You're thinking, hey, look at that rough circle. Let me go sand that at the sander. Don't do it. Remember, this is a scrap piece of wood. This is gonna come off and go in the trash can. It doesn't need any more sanding or any more effort. What we wanna do is mount this on the bottom of the bowl so we can screw the face plate into it. So from here, what I wanna do is go right here next door to the drill press. Now at the drill press, I'm gonna put the 1 16th inch drill bit into the three jaw chuck. That's the tiniest drill bit that we have. Now, the next thing I need to do is drill the hole in the center of this block. So for that, we're gonna grab this tool out of the tool panel. This is called the center finder. Now, this isn't gonna end up being perfect in the middle, but that's good. It's close enough since this is actually a piece of scrap wood that's gonna come off of the project and go in the trash can. There you go. That's close enough. You see those three marks where they kind of intersect. I'm going to put the hole right there. All right, there's the hole. That is just about ready to go on to my bowl. So let's go back to the table and I'll show you how to attach this to the bowl. So the last thing I need to do with this little block is I'm going to go back to my uh, hand tool cabinet. I'm going to get a nail out of the nail can in there. Notice I drilled the hole with the drill press because I want the hole to go straight through this block of wood. I'm going to take the nail and using a hammer, right? Be careful that the head is not ready to fall off. I'm gonna drive that nail into this block of wood. And then, as you can see, the nail pokes through the other side. So be careful that you're doing that on a scrap piece of wood. I don't want that nail to go in very far. Remember, this is gonna actually go into the bottom of your bowl. So I'm gonna take one last tool. I'm gonna take these tools with the blue handle. These are called nippers. And I'm gonna put that on the nail and I'm gonna clip the nail off so that I have just about one eighth of an inch. That's about it. A little less than one eighth of an inch sticking out of the block. And now this is ready to attach to the bottom of my bowl. To attach it, I need a piece of paper. Remember, glue is stronger than wood. So if I glue that and stick it on the bowl, that's permanent to get that apart is gonna break some of the wood. What I need is something that will tear apart very easily, paper. So as I put glue on the backing block, here is another guarantee. I've done this before. Some of you found out the hard way that I was right. Here's a guarantee I can make for you. If you put a little glue on like that and you stick that on the back of your block, or in the back of your bowl, it is gonna fall off when you try turning it on the lathe. It's gonna rip off the lathe, it might break the bowl, and you're gonna have to start over from the beginning. If you want this block to stay attached to your bowl, and you wanna be able to turn the bowl completely and have a finished product to turn in, you have to cover this entire backing block with glue. So I'm gonna grab my blue brush, spread the glue around, And it's possible that I might find that I need a little more. I need the whole surface well covered 
with plenty of glue. Alright, that looks pretty good. Next thing I need is a piece of paper. And I'm going to take the paper, make sure the paper is covering the whole circle. And I'm going to put that on there. I can poke the nail through the back of the paper. So you can see the nail sticking out there. Now I'm going to move to the bowl and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to take the glue. Again, if I just drip some glue on there like that and stick this on there, the guarantee I make is that bowl is going to come off when you start working on it on the lathe. And hopefully the bowl doesn't hit you in the face. Hopefully it just hits the ground. Potentially it breaks and now we have to do it all over again. So that's not a good idea. I'm going to come back, grab my glue brush. And again, I'd rather err on the side of too much glue than not enough in this particular case. I do not want this bowl to break free and fly off of the lathe. All right, that looks pretty good. Now notice it's not around the edge, but I note that my circle, my backing block, isn't quite as big as the bottom here. So I left the glue off around the outside edge because there's plenty of glue to cover the block. Now, the last thing here. So now what I wanna do is I wanna take that nail and I have to find the hole in the bottom of the bowl. And I want to feel the nail just slide down in that hole right there. There it is. And what we're really trying to do is we're trying to make sure that the nail on the backing block is exactly in the center of the bowl because we're gonna have to take this faceplate and center it right over the top of that nail. If any of this is off center, when the bowl turns, it's gonna wobble like that instead of turning around a, a perfect center. So. That looks good. We've got the nail in the center of the backing block. We now have the nail in the hole in the bottom of the bowl. So we're gonna go ahead and clamp this. Come on back with me to the table saw and let's go clamp this down. All right, well, here is the clamps that we're gonna use to clamp the bowl down. Um, Notice when you get back here, there may be other bowls clamped down from another class period, which is fine. What you're gonna do is use the one that happens to be empty. All right, as I use this clamp, the first thing I wanna remember is, it's extremely important that all of these rings stay centered. This has to be concentric like a bullseye. If it's not, we're gonna pull this out of the clamp tomorrow and throw it in the trash can because we cannot turn a, ring, a bowl that's not centered. It's gonna go around and around like that and it will never work. So we have to throw it out. You have to do all this work over again. Fortunately, we gave ourselves some uh, helpful lines on here with a pencil so that we could make sure this gets centered as we clamp it. So I'm gonna make use of the line I drew down the side and I'm gonna make use of the circles I drew around each ring. So I'm going to set it under there. I'm going to have this little piece right here come down on the center of my bowl. And then as I start to tighten it, I want to watch the rings. I want to see that the rings don't shift. If a ring starts to shift, then I'm going to back this up. I'm going to carefully push that ring over till it's back lined up. And then I may even need to hold it. I gotta do whatever it takes to keep all the rings aligned exactly the way I marked them over there at the table as I put pressure on it. Now, the other thing to think about, I don't wanna put too much pressure. If I put too much pressure down on this bowl, it's gonna crack everything, right? Remember, there's a hollow bowl down in here, it's hollow. So as I push down, and we're gonna to start to put a strain on the wood and it'll break if I put too much pressure. 
I'm going to put just a little bit at a time. I'll do a little bit more. And what I, what I would hope to see is a little bit of glue oozing out of the rings. Once I start to see that, I'm probably good. I can stop putting on the pressure at that point and I can just let this sit. I also want to make sure I write my name on here because I'm going to have to take off when the end of period comes around and during another period they're going to probably want to take this bowl out and use it for their own bowl. So I need to, I'm going to write my name, Mr. Sorensen on here. And I'm going to write the period that I'm in because if this bowl was put here last period, then we may want to just go ahead and leave it. If the bowl was put here yesterday or the period before, then it's it's dried for plenty of time and I can take this bowl, go put it in period uh, one, and I can put my bowl on here. So I'm gonna put my name and I'm gonna put the period that I'm in. And then I can leave that and I can go on whether it's working on something else or it's if it's time to go I can I can take off leave the bowl right here until it's dry somebody else will put it back in your cupboard that's where you should expect to find it tomorrow we're almost ready to put the bowl on the lid my last step is to mount the bowl on the face plate so to do that I'm going to come over here to the wall right behind lathe number one and I want to get two things. First of all, I need to get the face plate and I'm going to choose one of these small face plates like that. They tend to work the best. We have best luck with those. There's a variety of face plates here that can work, but I'm going to choose that one. There's a black one and a red one. Um, the next thing I need to choose is I need to start with, I need two drywall screws and they are right back here behind me. There's a box right here and mounted on the front of the box is a series of screws. I want the drywall screws. So I'm going to reach in here and I'm going to grab two drywall screws. Once I have verified that my bowl is attached to the face plate correctly, there's about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight screws in here. I'm going to need to come back and get the, the remaining six screws and put them in. But to start with, I'm just going to use these two screws and this face plate. Let's go over and attach the face plate to the back of our bowl. So once I mount the face plate on the back of the bowl, uh, a really important feature here is that this face plate has to be centered on the back. Now, throughout this bowl, I have given you a number of guarantees. Here's another guarantee. If you don't put the face plate in the dead center, I'm going to tell you to go back and do it all over again. So this isn't like, hey, I got it kind of close. I think it's going to be good. As soon as we put it on the lathe, it's going to be extremely obvious if you are just a fraction off of center. And if it is, I'm going to look at it and say, go put this back. You need to move it to the center. It's not in the center yet. So this is not a just get it close. This has to be spot on. So to do that, I'm going to take my face plate and I'm going to set it on the back of the bowl. I have this backing block that I'm going to screw my face plate into. And I have another really good thing that will help me with this process. I have a nail right in the dead center of the bowl. So looking through the hole that's in the face plate, I'm going to set it on there and then I'm going to look right down through the top of the face plate to make sure that that nail is in the dead center of the circle. Now, one option would be that I simply hold it there and draw a line around it. So that could be helpful because now I have a pretty good idea of where the faceplate needs to go. And if I attach it and I can tell that it has shifted out of that circle, then I'm going to have to stop, unscrew it, move it back, put the screws in again. The bottom line is it has to be perfect or you're going to have to do it over. There is no close.
I'm also only going to use two screws because, like I mentioned over at the lathe, there's eight screws in the back of this faceplate. If I put eight screws in and then realize I'm a little off and have to move all eight screws over, the back of this is quickly going to begin to look like Swiss cheese, and that's going to make it really difficult to get the faceplate secured right in the center where we have to have it. So, two screws until I know for sure that I'm dead on. So, I'm going to make sure that my faceplate is right in the middle of my circle. I'm going to use for this the battery operated drill. This is the impact driver. I'm going to put that screw in a little ways. And now I'm going to put the second screw in and I want to put it on the opposite side, directly opposed to that first screw. Right, this is where it's important that I get it in the right spot. As I go to put this in, I don't want the I don't want the faceplate to shift at all. All right. The two screws are in. I'm going to look at it. Uh, I'm going to shift it over a little bit. It When I put the two screws in, it shifted slightly. And that slight shift makes a huge difference. So I'm going to do it again. Okay, so that looks a little bit better. Now, so before I add the remaining six screws, I'm gonna actually take the bowl back over to the lathe. I'm gonna put it on the lathe and I'm going to try spinning it. And then if it spins okay, I'm gonna turn the lathe on, turn the lathe off and watch what the bowl does. And I wanna make sure the bowl is not shaking violently back and forth. That's never gonna work, obviously. So I wanna make sure these are good before I go to any more trouble to put screws in. So let's go on back to the lathe and check out what that looks like. So here I am at the lathe. Now, the lathe can be set up for a spindle project or it can already be in use for a faceplate project. You have to get it set up for the project you're actually working on. In this case, I was turning a spindle on here, so I need to undo a few things. I'm going to loosen the tailstock and back that up and take my spindle off. And for a spindle, I have to have a live center. So I'm going to grab this knockout rod out off the tool panel. I'm going to stick it through the hole in this, uh, the hand wheel. And I'm going to tap on the live center and get it out of the lathe. put all that back on the holder and now I'm ready to install my bowl in there. Last thing I will do is remove the tool rest, get the tool rest out of the way. And I'm going to put my bowl on the lathe. Now I'm going to spin it to start with by hand. I want to make sure nothing's hitting. What I do is listen to hear if I hear any sound. Usually the sound is a giveaway that something's hitting. So far everything looks and sounds good. So now I'm going to turn this on and turn it off and just watch the lathe and see what the bowl does. Now, you can see as the bowl spins, it looks like a target. It's very concentric. There's no wobbling going on, right? Normally, these rings would be moving back and forth if I had a problem. This bowl is in great shape, doesn't need any extra work. I'm ready to go add all six remaining screws and start turning on the lathe. All right, well, I've got my last six screws. So let's go on back over to the table. We'll add the additional six screws to the faceplate and the bowl will be ready to turn on the lathe. All right, well, there are my six additional screws. The faceplate is now mounted uh, in the back of the bowl and it's been a long process, but we now have the bowl cut out of a 1x12 piece of pine. 
um, cut into rings, glued back together, stacked up, and in the, in the condition that we can now put this on the lathe and actually start turning it into our salad bowl. So, to do that, we're gonna move to a new video, part two, and part two is gonna be 100% on the lathe, looking at the fairly complex process of cutting a bowl or turning a bowl out of this uh, bowl shape that we've made. So, hope you've enjoyed the process and this has helped you get your bowl put together into this condition. And I look forward to seeing you next time when we actually start doing all the fun stuff on the lathe itself.
Another important thing to remember is that if this ring goes through the machine and falls and hits the ground, it's gonna break apart. We don't want that to happen. So we need to be very careful not to let the ring fall once it goes through the machine. Alright, well on that pass, I can tell that the surface is now smooth. Both sides line up, and I'm done with that. So, I'm going to turn the ring over, and now I'm going to sand the opposite side.